I figured that probably the easiest thing to talk about is your life because that's kind of what you know. And it was a really interesting process because I've never really given much thought to why I do what I do. Um, so it was quite an intense process of, of reflection. And yeah, I will share this with you. Uh, as my mother always says, I came out fighting as a fiery little bundle. And uh, it was very clear from day one that I was not here to conform. And I pretty much challenged every single thing that I could challenge, especially if it was authority or rules. And needless to say, this made for a rather disastrous uh, school career. <laughs> Uh, my mother was probably the first mother to be called into the um, headmistress's office and told that they wanted to de-head girl me in standard five. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so most of my life I've kind of fought against, against systems and, and never really understood. I didn't understand why I was even doing it. Um, and more recently I've come across systems thinking which has just been the most amazing thing for me because I was able to kind of zoom out and detach myself from being in the middle of fighting and to see that I could start to understand the world as a system and rather than fighting it, try to find places to intervene um, that would result in greater levels of, of freedom and justice. Uh, part of the reason why they wanted to de go me was because I wasn't interested in telling anybody to pull up their socks. Um, after break, I couldn't work out why, you know, why shouldn't they have the freedom to put their socks up or down? What is it, you know, what is it to me? Um, so, much of my career has been um, incredibly diverse. I've worked in, in a broad spectrum of, of spaces and places, anything from drawing a garage up to sort of large city scale planning um, with government in private sector and more recently uh, running a social enterprise. And I'm going to share with you one of the projects that had a really big impact on me. Um, it was a, a township in Cape Town and it was a, a, a putting together a development framework for um, looking at how to stimulate local economic growth. And I realized that there was something in this township that was incredibly honest and there was a, a real sense of connectedness, and I understood that. It made sense to me. I also realized that what a lot of people saw to be quite chaotic, I found to be incredibly alive and exhilarating, and I wanted to be part of that. I felt sorry for people who lived in, in suburbs and had to go back to these really kind of boring, disconnected spaces. And I also realized that a lot of what we want to do is to try to impose order onto this, onto this very dynamic system. That's not what I did, but <laughs> um, it's just a very archetypical idea of how people want to sort of impose this order. And then I also realized that we tend to look at, at these areas and we ask what the needs are and we look at the problems and we don't really look very much at what are the assets and what are the really good things that are working here and how can we use those things to, um, as a basis of development and then maybe the bad things just don't exist anymore. So, as we went through this process, I became incredibly frustrated with it and it had a lot to do with the way that the, the citizen participation was dealt with. Uh, we, the first part of the process, it was a big multidisciplinary team and the first kind of five months, I think, of the process was research, which was done um, having a one weekly meeting in a massive boardroom in the middle of Cape Town in someone's office and very little engagement with what was really going on in this area. We did have a design collaboration process, which was amazing, it was a workshop, but when we got there, we realized that People wanted to talk and they wanted to be heard and we were there ready to design you know we wanted to come up with solutions so there was this immediate kind of disconnect between where we were because we hadn't engaged in any sort of research participation allowing people to speak so and the process kind of went went on and we developed a big document about what you need to do here with hundreds of different projects and 
the document was never shared with the, the citizens. I think a copy of it was put in the library in English when everybody else was um, closer. And, and that made me really angry. And then further to that, we had to decide where the money, we had quite a small budget for this project, where the money was going to be spent, how to prioritize all these projects. And again, no one asked the citizens what they thought should be done. And I just, I felt deeply betrayed by this whole system and how it had kind of played itself out. And it ended up sending me back to university where I um, did a master's in, in urban infrastructure. And it was kind of a, quite a big career change from more design focused urban design and architecture into planning and, um, and more about sort of community development and, and such things. And this is where I came into contact with systems thinking. And also one of our greatest teachers, which I've come to learn from, uh, that has approximately 3.8 million years of experience of how to do things on our planet. And this being our natural ecosystems. So, I've started to look at um, what the relationship between natural ecosystems is and artificial ecosystems, which are our cities or our towns. And how there's a complete disconnect between how these two things function. So this diagram, while it may look um, complex, along the outside is a natural ecosystem. You have plants, animals, and bacteria. And materials cycle. There's nothing that's not in that system that doesn't keep cycling around that system. Nothing comes in from outside. Um, and also, the only input that does come in is solar energy. When you start to look at the um, human-created systems, cities, towns, artificial ecosystems in the center, something completely different happens. Where our materials basically flow in from outside and we spew them out again on the other side, expecting that the natural ecosystem, which has a perfectly balanced system, is just going to keep absorbing and giving, absorbing and giving. And I found this to be incredibly striking because it was just how, how did this happen? You know, how was this, this massive disconnect come about? And some work of Barry Gasson, who has map material flows in Cape Town. Also, um, this is just one example, the energy flows, where electricity, as a ratio, we extract it at three. By the time it gets into the city to be used, already half of it is wasted. And I was completely struck by the waste that's in this system. And I, and I started wondering, how come we give this kind of system to people who are poor. Isn't this just a poverty trap in itself? You know, how can we possibly give this to somebody who only has one man, 50 cents of it is wasted along the, along the way. And then I further started to think, well, hold on, maybe the reason we can't service everybody is because we're giving such wasteful services to the few people who do have services. And so it got me thinking about how should we be doing services? And so I started doing research in, in informal settlement. And the main idea with this was, partly because of my experience with the project I've just mentioned, was that we need to describe what is happening before we start to intervene. Um, and Danilo Meadows, Meadows talks about the fact that 99% of what goes wrong in systems goes wrong because we don't actually understand what was going on, you know, what, what was going on before we tried to intervene. So I developed a descriptive model of, of how an informal settlement works using a material flow analysis. Material flow analysis is part of the kind of urban ecology movement that looks at this and tries to understand this disconnect between how things work in the natural ecosystem and how things work in a, in a um, artificial or a city or a town. So it just mapped three different kind of functional categories. Where do people get stuff from in order to nourish and clean themselves? Where do they get stuff from to reside and work? And how do they transport and communicate themselves? Um, and looking at production, consumption and decomposition to understand how much of that was happening within their boundary because another glaring difference between the two is 
that in a natural ecosystem, production, consumption, and decomposition happens very close to each other in proximity. Whereas ours is kind of this massive spread over, over the globe made in China. So what I found is that food was predominantly linked to global, global flows of food. There's, I mean, there's small examples of this, but not much of it. Uh, there is some kind of meat that's happened and traded locally. Water was interesting because once water is collected and taken to somebody's house, it becomes a very precious asset because someone has now had to kind of put their energy into it. And water gets cycled, so it gets used for cleaning, and then for cleaning the house, and then for cleaning clothes, and then lastly, and so it gets reused, which is very different to how it is in the formal sector. Um, the problem is that once it gets thrown away, there is no drainage system, right? So people have provided water, but they haven't provided a drainage system. So the water that gets thrown away is basically black water. It's really, really dirty. And it gets thrown outside the houses, so obviously ma massive um, health issues with that. But also it drains into the, the groundwater and pollutes the groundwater, which, is, which is actually becomes a city, a city issue. And then this is an interesting picture because Obviously, it's due to bad services, but in urban ecology, this would represent kind of quite a major opportunity that water is nutrient rich. So it would be, okay, looking at that water, instead of seeing it as waste, it's a whole, it's basically like a mine. There's a whole lot of resources in there and nutrients that we can um, extract. Then the house building is really interesting because ultimately, um, informal settlements are a really big environmental sink in the city because a lot of the materials that are used to build them would otherwise end up in landfills from, you know, from the formal sector demolitions and stuff. And house building is also one of the biggest economic, um, local economic development opportunities. At the moment it happens, I don't know how much money is exchanged, but I think sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's social. But it also started me questioning, why are we building houses? If it's the one thing that people in informal settlements do, surely we should be finding ways to support what people are already doing. So creating businesses around house building and not taking it away from them as something that they are able to do. Then more recently, I've been doing work in, um, on a new growth area in Nigeria. And this is a very interesting, so these are two different diagrams of material flows. So that's the one that I just showed you, which is a descriptive looking at what it is and how it is. And this is one that I've started to develop, designing how we want materials to flow. Um, Claire from the Biomimicry Institute suggested that I send this to the Museum of Modern Art as a, um, as a very good representation of where we are now and where we need to get to. Um, so you can see how everything in there just cycles within the settlement. Um, it's designing the material flows and seeing how we then take that and make it into a spatial. So how does it affect how we make cities? What do they look like? How different do they look? Um, and that's a, a work in progress and I'm sure quite a long, um, quite a long project. Uh, more recently, I mentioned that I run a social enterprise. So the other work that I do is, is a really exciting initiative. Uh, at the moment, it's called People with a Mission. And I think it's, it's kind of a, a collabor collaboration of everything that I've experienced and, and this, this need to try and challenge everything um, put into one. And it's essentially trying to deal with, with emergence and self-organization which I think is what I was recognizing in those township pictures to be what was so exhilarating. And the disconnect between something like consultants coming in there to try to um, intervene in these systems that are incredibly emergent and self-organizing. And these are so not. They're governed by bodies, they have rules, everything is kind of predefined how you have to work. And then these two come together and it doesn't work. <laughs> Well, it's incredibly difficult to make it work. So I have started set up, setting up this um, initiative. 
getting people from the formal sector who but just a completely diverse group of people anything from engineers to yoga teachers to artists to um, urban designers, there's a whole range of people. So partly because these people don't all know how to work together, and then getting people from the from an informal settlement, in this case it's it's kind of located in, the, in an area. So it's all volunteer based, and the idea is what happens when we put all these people together in a series of discussions and learning, and, and a kind of a shared learning process, what emerges out of this thing when we, we don't have an idea of where we're trying to get to or, or what we need to do? It's a non-funded project, which means that we don't have a whole lot of non-negotiables. So it's decentralizing funding down to each individual who's involved. They're responsible for their own time and managing their own inputs into it. And yeah, it's at the very early phases, but it will be interesting to see how it kind of challenges and, and comes up hopefully with new solutions to the stuff that I've been battling with my life. <laughs> so thank you.